today is the last thing I will uh, mention even more recent works. So remember what, where we are. I've explained the idea of um, uh, summary statistics and uh, if their effective dynamics. And on top of that, the, this, this extra thing that you had, this critical regime. So today I will not go to the critical regime. I'll just look at the, the idea of how do you find summary statistics when you don't know enough. Right, so the examples I, I gave, uh, let's say tensor PCA, matrix PCA, or or um, XOR, uh, where systems were in some sense they were natural suspects, they were natural things that you would want to look at. And so, in general, the next question we have to do now is how do you find this summary or this autonomous statistics when the loss function is not as easy as before. So I propose here um, this spectral dynamical whatever BVP transition that is supposed to be do and I, I imagine, I guess, I propose that this thing is general. And I will treat this on two examples. Uh, the, the advantage here being that this would give you a way to find summary statistics algorithmically, right, without knowing anything. Okay, so the question is how do you find summary statistics and also how, how can you make sure that these, the effective dynamics, these projected dynamics of these summary statistics are good enough to describe the performance. Right? Because again, finding summary statistics, it's not hard. Project on zero, that's a summary statistics. Right? And, but then it does, it's not informative enough. Right? So here I want to have summary statistics that really capture the performance. So one way is the spectral approach. So you could try, I'm not saying that's, that's easy to do algorithmically, but at least it's feasible, to follow the spectrum of natural, natural objects along the trajectory of the SGD. So I give you a trajectory, whatever this, this could be done for many other problems, not only uh, data science, it could be in physics and all sorts of things. You have a trajectory and along this trajectory, this tra and you are, the important thing again is we're in very high dimension. So this trajectory is just a little slice of something enormous, supposed to be informative, supposed to be going where you want it to go, right? The question of course is always the same. We want this to go close to the minimum in a short-ish time, but we want to have a, a, a a tool to diagnose whether we are in a good place or not, right? Because remember, there's nobody telling you the value you're finding now. Imagine you look at the value, it goes down and then stays put for a long while. You could say, okay, I'm close to the minimum, but there's no guarantee. If Maybe if you wait much longer, this goes much deeper, right? So you want to have something like a diagnosis tool. So this would be, why don't you follow the spectrum of the natural objects along the trajectory of the SGD? So what are those nat natural objects? One of them is, remember, we are minimizing a function, so you could look at the Hessian of this function, right? And otherwise, this function is a special structure in general when you have a, a deep network. The function is the composition of different functions which are given by the layers. So you could also look at the layer-wise Hessians, right? That's also something you have access to. If you don't want to compute second order things, you could look at the gram matrix, right? Which is you could look at the, if you want, to, at the uh, singular values of the of the gradient, right? You take the gradient, gradient star, look at this, the eigenvalues, and that's that has an advantage, is, as I explained before, that this is first order. You don't have to compute the Hessian, and in fact, you had to compute the gradient along the trajectory because you have, in order just to find the trajectory, you need the gradient. Right, so, so this is, uh, in some sense, more, I mean, safer. Why would the Hessian and the Gram matrix have the same spectral structure? Of course, there is no reason, right? These are very, two very different objects. But just think a minute. Imagine that, indeed, you start from the, the ab initio principle that I have in mind, which is, for good problems, in the good region of parameters, 
this, this function of an enormous large number of, enormously large number of variables is, is in fact a function of 17 variables, mainly. Right? Then if it's really like that, it's Hessian and it's Gram matrix will both have essentially 17 Nagin values very far from all the rest. Right? So this, is, this would be a signature of what you have in mind, which is that the function roughly depends on a, a few variables. Okay, so and that's what we'll see in the right regimes, in the right parameter zones, what could hope for a BBP transition, a dynamical, where the top modes of these random matrices, because they are random matrices, of course, your function being random, all these things are random, they, are in, they could be do, doubly random, if you, they could be along the trajectory and you have the randomness of your system. But the, uh, so the top modes of these random matrix, matrices are, are outliers, they stop uh, eigenstates or uh, eigenvectors are far from the the eigenvalues are far from the rest, far enough from the bulk, and 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 um, you can imagine now that the projection on those outlier eigenspaces would be autonomous and would give you information about the performance of the system. Right. Okay. So. This pro the projection would be the, our summary statistics and their effective dynamics should rule the performance of SGD. All that is my uh, credo, right? What I, what I believe in most cases should happen in order to just, this is the philosophy I'm projecting here. But of course, in order to <coughs> make this something else than a blah, blah, I need a few examples. Okay, so this was done, yeah? Just out of curiosity, do you have uh, any more uh, any, uh, mathematical justification about your philosophy? It's, it's coming. The examples are what it is. So, and in particular, the first justification was numerical. So you have this first work by Papian, Vardan Papian in 2018. I just found it on, I mean, I've known it for a while now, but I've never seen it. I don't think it has been published, I don't know. And then you have a very nice paper by Papian, Han and David Donohoe, published in Proceedings of the National Academy, uh, called the, which studies what, what they call the neural, I mean, they're not the only one to call the neural collapse. So we'll describe this. So this was numerically Papian, so showed, um, something very, very clear spectrally. And so, okay, maybe let me, let me go back to what, they, what he did here. He looked at the class, classification task, the, sim, the, the most natural workhorse of classification, classification in K classes for Gaussian mixture, and did SGD and along this thing with the usual network, one layer, one hidden layer, two layers, and, and looked at the spectrum of this big thing. It didn't think of the Gram matrix, it looked at the Hessian, and found numerically a structure that was interesting. Okay? So the, and this is the first example, the main example I will treat here. We will look at this mathematically, okay? not numerically. So what did he find? He found that after Okay, I don't have a picture here. I'm not good enough to, uh, to do that. But he found something like, I mean, this is a very rough picture. <coughs> so the Hessian, if you're, I think it was in dimension 10 to the 7 or 8, I forgot. So the Hessian tends, has 10 to the 7 eigenvalues. So you had 10 to the 7 eigenvalue, crazy thing like this. I have no idea. Even, Completely no shape. The, the, this, is, these are the, this is the histogram of the eigenvalues. No structure and you don't care about it. And then, then he saw, not initially, but after a little while in the SGD dynamics, he saw the little, what he called, so this would be called the bulk. This would be called the mini bulk. And further away, you will have the outliers. So this was essentially, if you, if you looked at a classification in, for K classes, this would have K points, 
when everything worked well. This was something of dimension essentially k square. In fact, it's not really k square, it's k k minus 1 over 2, but. And that was capital N minus all the rest. So that was a huge number. Again, the structure, all this doesn't count. If this distance here, let me cut it. If this distance is very large, then essentially what is this saying about the function? Right? You have, as I explained before, a very large number of curvatures, because these are the eigenvalues of the Hessian. So this gives you the curvatures. In different, you know, after a change of basis, it gives you direction and curvatures. Most of these curvatures are zero. Right? If you, if you, this is not zero, this is whatever it is, but compared to this very large distance, this is very small. So the picture you should have in mind is that everything is like in, in 10 to the 9 minus 17 direction, it's flat. And in 17 direction, it's this one, it's curved, seriously curved. And in the middle, you have this thing that we'll come back to. Okay? So it's natural to think that if you project in these direction, this motion will be much more, and, so, and when you start at random, typically, so you imagine this very uh, flat valley, but if you, if, if you start at random, you may start here. So here you may move in this direction, in the flat direction, this is for free, but of course you have many more, much more chances to move in the very curved directions. And this, this motion here should be our, sum uh, our effective dynamics. Okay, so that's the kind of picture that, that um, Papian saw numerically, and, um, and we will try to understand that more mathematically. Okay, so th we do that rigorously for a general thing in this paper with Rezag, the same authors, Rezag, Esari, Okojaganat, and this time there's uh, the contribution of Zhao Yang Huang, who is a very strong specialist of random matrix. And this, is, this has been accepted. This would be published in one of those uh, machine learning conferences, 24. So this is, uh, this is to appear. And the long version is submitted to a mass journal, and it's online, easy to find. It goes back a few months. OK? So this work consists in proving, the as I said, the dynamical ever emergence of this BBB transition. And so we, we do it then, you know, we don't have an abstract nonsense theorem for whatever. But we have, we do it for this classification of a mixture of K-Gaussian with a one-layer network, which was what Papian did numerically. And then we look at the harder case of the two-layer classification for the XOR problem, which I explained last time. Right? Like last time, this is when I told you, when you take the XOR thing, the summary statistics may have this completely crazy dynamics and all sorts of things, right? So we'll look at this case, which is harder. And by the way, I was, Blanchard, Gilles Blanchard asked me last time, I think that the historical thing I told about XOR was shifted by a decade. I, saw, I said it, this winter was in, of, of AI was in the, you know, XOR restarted in the 90s, but in fact it was before. So XOR, the, the big thing about XOR, which was pushed as a, something that would kill the field, was the, the, the big thing by, uh, was in 69, and, and then there was a long story about it in the 70s, and a winter later, and then it came back. Okay, so of course more is coming. This last work is not the last work, there's many more. I received two days ago a paper by colleagues doing things very similar, so this is moving. So what we do is we look at this interplay between the training dynamics the ISGD, and again, the SGD I will choose is online SGD, okay, the one I've explained up to now. And then the spectral composition of this uh, empirical Hessian matrix and empirical gram matrix over the course of training. Okay. So what's, that's, before I, I give any theorem, that's what we see. Shortly into training in this model, let's take the classification model. The empirical Hessian and the empirical Gram matrix. So, of course, if you could have access to the true Hessian and the true 
RAM matrix, the population ones, then you could just look at them, but you don't have access to that. So you could look at empirical versions. So you look at your trajectory, you look at a point. At this point, you may look at the empirical version of the Hessian or the empirical version of the Gram matrix. Uh, have outliers, C of K in the cl classification with K task. You don't, you don't immediately necessarily have the K classes out. And the SGD itself, the state of the, of the SGD, is set, predominantly lives in this eigenspace, the top eigenspace. Right? So it really means that the, essentially, that's, that's the picture I was drawing clumsily over there. Essentially, everything moves in, this, in those directions. Okay? And the performance of the classifier, so that's only saying something like it's good uh, summary statistics. The, the perf then I have to talk about the performance and so the performance. Shortly, on purpose. Very fast, or you're going to be very fast, or yeah, uh, yeah. So it de it depends on the model, right? So it's this short. How short is that? Is the main question. That in the case when k is one, remember when we had this uh, single index model that was classified by what I call the the uh, information exponent. When k one, it was very fast. When k was two, it was a little slower. And when k was three or more, it was very slow. Okay, so here we see that in these models, we don't have the notion of an of a information exponent in general, because of course it's much harder when you're not in dimension one. But but uh, in these examples, we see that it's short. Here there are many things that I have not yet specified which can change this short, and I will tell you. Okay. So when you have multi-layers, so here the, uh, the classification is in one layer, the XOR is in two layers, this alignment with the top spectrum happens within each layer. And if you have more than one layer, you could look at the Hessian of each layer as a function. And this, the, 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 there is an alignment, each of them can have such a spectral transition. Here I was talking with one layer only. And for each of these outlier eigenspaces have some sense. That's what we'll see. Uh, sorry, uh, how do you distinguish, because you have just this big loss function, so how do you distinguish the layers? Do you just see the derivative with respect to the loss Each function, yeah, so each layer defines a function, mm -hmm. right? So you look at the Hessian of this thing. Okay, okay? that's the. Yeah, which is, it's given the other form. Yeah. I mean, you, yeah. just... you fix the other ones. You don't have to, but I'm saying there is information in each layer. And that's what people, practitioners know. They would tell you when you have a multi-layer thing and a complex classification task, typically you have something where you would learn certain big large scale picture in the first layer, smaller scale picture in the second layer and things of that nature. And we'll see something like that here. Importantly, this looks like a very success, success story, but not necessarily. The alignment is not predicated on success, this classification task. That is. The, it could be that, you know, remember when we had the XOR model? The XOR model could go to bad classifiers. Remember, we had an enormous number of uh, uh, sticky points. See, if the SGD, if you're on a time scale such that your SGD is converging to a suboptimal classifier, you may have outliers and they may be bad. Right? So you have to be careful. Okay, so let me. Well, that is just blah, blah. I give you the picture. Now let's take a, a model, a serious one. So we take the classification of a KGMM, remember, means Gaussian mixture model. So that's the kind of really workhorse of classification. You have K classes, dog, cats, and cars. And you want to classify. You have pictures of this thing. You want to say, I want to classify. So you, of course, have no clue about the structure of the real distribution. One way to think of it is the distribution is really centered on three different things in a high, very high dimensional space. Because, of course, in order to describe the, the center of mass for the pictures of dogs, it's, it's high dimensional. And around them, I just put whatever distribution. So the simplest is to take Gaussian. Okay. Then, so let me describe this. KGMM is, is just, so you fix an integer here, this K will be the number of classes. So K is my usual 17. Then you have numbers which are, where is the, okay, I don't know how to do that, okay. 
These PAs are, of course, the, the mixture. So the PAs are between 0 and 1, and they are, the sum is 1. Okay? So you could have, I don't know, 1 fourth, 1 fourth, 1 half, if you have 3. And then, then you look at this mixture of Gaussian. So sum of a PA of the Gaussian centered at a certain mu A. And the variance here, again, I don't complicate things. I put all the same covariance. And 1 over lambda is the variance. So lambda is a signal-to-noise ratio. The strongest the lambda, the, the more these things are peaked. And so the easier the classification task is. Okay? If lambda is zero or very close to zero, you have a huge variance. And your, your, if you have three peaks, your three peaks are in fact very wide. And then doing the classification will be hard. Okay, so that's the mixture of my K Gaussian in RD. D will be very large. That's my data dimension what I used to call n sometimes. So the task is to estimate this unknown probability distribution. You don't know the mixture, you don't know the, the centers of classes, the mu A. And you have data of size m, as always, IID data from this. So you take m pictures and you want to classify them into dog, cats, and cars. Okay? That's the task. But, in fact, the task I said supervised. So the task is a little simpler than that. Because you have an expert, it's supervised. So you have somebody, you, you take a certain number of pictures, and somebody has looked at them and told you this is a cat, this is a dog, this is, this is a car. So we are in the supervised case where the data is richer. The data now has this shape, I call them Z. It's a little Y and a capital Y. So the Y's are IID sample of the, in, of the label. So their distribution is this. This 1A is just the, 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 the vector. 1A is the one hot vector like the, the guys in machine learning will say. In the A position. So that just means that your, your YL ha, is the probability that little YL is A is one indicator of A, rather, is PA. And then your distribution is just that. So we will assume that the means are linearly independent, to simplify things. Because, of course, if my means were all in the same space, it would be degenerate. And the goal is to perform the classification there. So this, this is just a blah blah to tell you, with each YL comes the answer. You know which class it's supposed to be. Yeah. And this is this is quite genetically relevant. No, I, I, apart from me, maybe the lambda could change with a, but I suppose you can you could include that yeah. in the analysis. But m many data systems look like that. No. But yeah, of course, of course. But but you have here the important thing. Is here and the Gaussian is not a bad choice. No, but, but the, and then in fact we co we can prove a lot of that without the Gaussian thing. But, but again, it's like 80 pages you don't want to do. I'm sorry? The Gaussian is not necessary in the data. I mean That's what we did, we're discussing, yes. It's, but, but I state things with Gaussian because the computations are simpler. But the, the, uh, so the important thing again here is somebody has classified. Right? You could also do non-supervised, do non-supervised. But of course it costs. That's precisely why, why M is not that big. Having pictures of cars and cats and whatever, that's not expensive. But having somebody l looking at this and saying, this is a car, this is a cat, this is a car, this is a dog, that costs money. So the goal is to perform the classification task. And so we do it by the single layer network, hidden layer network, which is called all versus one, whatever. We use the cross entropy loss and an L2 regularizer. We already mentioned all, all, all these things before. That's what the industry do, do, does. And it's equivalent, if you know the word, to do the, doing the multi-class logistic regression. If there is a statistician here. So all this blah blah is to tell you that the loss function is this. Okay. So remember, it's a one-layer thing. So look at what's going on here. And that's, that's, so the, this log, log sum of exponential comes from the fact that we had the cross entropy loss. Right? And that's what we're looking at. 
Okay. So this Y, capital Y, is the, uh, my data. X is the parameter. So where is my parameter? It's in RD to the K. X is a collection of XA from one A being from one to K. Each XA is in RD, right? So each of these guys in RD. You take the inner product with Y, multiply by this, okay? And add this thing. So the space of the parameter is RD to the K. Okay, RD is the dimension of a picture, if you want. RD to the K is the dimension of, if you have three classes of three pictures. And then you add an L2 regularizer, as we do all the time, to, for, to, to force stability of this thing, to for, prevent it from going too far. So in the end, what are we doing? When we do SGD, I'm coming, now I, do, I can be a bit faster because I've already explained that a million times. So that's online SGD. I take X at time L is X at time L minus one, minus delta grad L at this position before, taken on the, on the, on the L sample zl remember is little y capital y l and this minus beta this is just the gradient of the l2 regularizer okay that's a damping fact i have to tell you that so we initialize from gaussian as before i normalize with the kind of standard size of gaussian in high dimension and i pick the learning rate delta to be capital o of one over d okay that's because i know that will be the right phase where things will work Okay, I could also give you a theorem saying that bad things will happen if you take delta too large, but let's stay there. So I just have a very simple thing. If you forget all this motivation, I have this crazy function. I'm looking at this optimization algorithm and I want to understand what's going on. So, oops, I'm sorry. How do I go back? Theorems uh, stated very vaguely. The solution of this SGD aligns with the outliers of the Hessian, what I was saying before. So let's try to really understand what that means. So this classification task, not only does the Hessian look like that, we also prove that, but essentially SGD, after a little initial phase, will live in the space generated by these guys. And more importantly, these guys will be very close to the centers of mass, to the mu a, which is what you want to find. So the, the SGD will essentially live in the space of the, of the classification task, of the mu's. Which is not enough yet, remember? What we, are, we don't want to find the space generated by the mu's. We want to find the mu's, right? But this tells you exactly like I had before, the projection in this thing will be autonomous. And then all sorts of things can happen. Right, in this dynamical system in dimension K. Will they find the right axis? So the neural collapse of Donohoe, Han, and Papian is precisely about this last phase, okay, in a special case. I'll come back to that. So let me introduce some spectral notations because I want to talk about spectrum. So first, let's look at the Hessian of the population loss. So remember the population loss, I think I called it phi, is the expectation of the loss, right? With the parameter X fixed, and z being my random output. So this x, remember, again, is in rd to the k. So that's the Hessian. Of course, we don't really have access to that. So, but we can still study it. In this case, we can compute the, the population loss. And theorem, that's a, I don't want to get into too many notations. That would take hours. I want to be short today. It's Friday. So, the spectrum of this Hessian, of the true Hessian, the population loss, is structured like that. Bulk plus mini bulk plus outliers. Okay? So let me explain that a little more. So if you want to remember something, that's the theorem to remember. Then if you want a little more precise formulation, let me explain that. So in this, uh, in this um, Hessian, remember it's an RD to the K, right? So the Hessian is, this Hessian is made of blocks, right? You have blocks depending on which of the K parts you're looking at, right? So you have off-diagonal blocks and on-diagonal blocks, right? So the off-diagonal blocks have the following structure. They have the form 
identity, so absolutely full rank, divided by lambda. Remember, lambda is the strength of my uh, signal, essentially, plus d, where d has this form. d is rank k square, right, which is quite compatible. Here it was, in fact, k square minus k. If you look at this, then d is all this. It's rank k square. So, more precisely, d has this shape. I mean, the, the head of diagonal block has this shape, where a is of rank k. So a will give you the, these k things when everything works well. b is of small rank 2, 2k, two and c is of rank k square. But the important thing, and of course you have identity here, which makes it full rank. The important thing is that you have a 1 over lambda here. So this is small when you have enough signal. right? And you have a 1 over lambda square, which makes it even smaller. So this term, you can forget it. That's the mini bulk. So this is equal to d. That's your d is decomposed. No, no, no. The, this, this whole thing is d. Is d, yeah. d is a plus b over lambda plus c over lambda square. OK? So that's the uh, structure of an off-diagonal rank. The on-diagonal rank are also of the same shape. I don't want to go to the same shape, 1 over uh, plus e, but this e now is of rank k square like before. So, but it doesn't necessarily have this structure uh, like that. But, but that's, it's the same structure, essentially. So now I will call ek of x, or, or, or Laplacian of x, the top eigenspace of the population Hessian. Right? I have this population he Hessian. I look at its top eigenspace, the direction of the top uh, k eigenvalues. The space in which I predicted that the system, the dynamics will essentially happen, right? The projection in these directions. Okay? So for the moment it's just notation and this is a little, of course you, this is computation, but this is calculus. This is not hard random matrix to see that the matrix is like that. To go from the structure of so this is just computing derivatives of this crazy function. That's, everybody can do that. The hard part is, of course, to go from the structure of this matrix to the structure of the spectrum. Yeah? I'm oh, sorry. Uh, C is, is going to be your mini bulk or your uh, identity plus B, your entire bulk? No, uh, yeah, you're right. The mini bulk is done both by this. Uh, no. D, OK, I shouldn't have written that. Forget that. The off-diagonal block has this form. OK? D is this plus that plus that. OK? The important thing is that in front of A, you don't have a 1 over lambda. Right? So this K structure here dominates as soon as lambda is a little large. And you don't need much lambda. OK, so with all that, OK, but now you could say, OK, great, but this is about the population Hessian, which is great because it already gives me a fact. The, if, I, if I told you this, that the, the SGD aligns, because that's the theorem, the SGD aligns with this space. Right? That's already a very interesting structural thing. But as a statistician, you can't do much with it because you don't know where this thing is. Right? So in, if you want to ch test that, another way to do that is to replace the population loss by some Empirical loss, so you could do that. Just so this is static so far. I mean, uh, in yeah, it's just one point. And how, how do you describe this k square? Because I mean, uh, I thought there was always like an, in your BBP transition an outlier, but the mini bulk I didn't. Uh, you could, so the B, because the the, the the way in in a general BBP there is no reason to have a mini bulk, but you could put it there if your perturbation is of this form. But precisely, you could analyze this, you know, let's imagine, imagine even that you had one diagonal block of this form, you could try to do BBP on that. Mm -hmm. And then you would see, of course, that this plays a role, but, you know, it, it's harder to quantify because when lambda is large, this is small. Right? But, but so far, your signal has k variables, and so the, the minimum, what does it correspond oh. to in the signal? So how do you describe it? You have k vectors, right? So which means that you also have their inner products. Okay. That's the minibulk. Oh, okay. 
So if you, if you, and this is what I'll do to simplify matters, if you take the, the classes to be orthogonal, this will just not be there. Okay, so now you have the Hessian version. So that's the, the, the empirical version. So I'm taking the, this empirical Hessian, I put in a hat, it's just the only thing I have access to. So that's the empirical loss. And then I can look at the Hessian of this loss and look at the top, eigen, the, the top k eigenvectors of this thing. And I call it the training empirical loss, right? Which means I have my, my m uh, data point, I build my trajectory with it, and with it I also build uh, 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 an estimator of the, of the loss, and so an estimator of the Hessian, and so an estimator of the top space, of the outlier space, right? Which maybe could be different from the true thing. Okay, I could also do something else. I could also do what is very often done in uh, there is I, I have my data I split it into two parts I use half of it to train and half of it to test so I could do the same thing with the test version so the test version I would put a little tilde right? so here I have another amount m tilde of data which I will not use for, for my optimization Right? All that is our possibilities. With that, I can construct a Hessian, I mean, a loss function, and then a Hessian, and then a top eigenspace. Right? At every point x of my RD, very large dimensional space, I could look at three Hessians. The Hessian of the true loss, the Hessian of my training loss, the Hessian of my um, test loss, right? which are two approximations of the true thing. Okay. All right, then here's the theorem. So there exist two constant, alpha zero and lambda zero, so if that if lambda is, so remember what that means, lambda large enough. Remember, lambda did not scale with dimension or anything, right? It was, it, one over lambda was the variance of my, was the width of my uh, peaks, my Ga Gaussian peaks, right? So lambda larger than lambda zero, there is no D in this thing, right? So that's, that's not, I'm not asking for a tiny, tiny, because if lambda was super, you know, if I had this thing where three, let's say three uh, means and I had tiny things like this, then of course the classification would be simple, right? But here I'm not doing that because I'm not asking that lambda diverges with dimension. So I have a constant lambda such that if lambda is larger than this constant, if m is larger than this other constant times d, so remember what that means, that's important. That's the number of sam the sample size. So because I'm doing online SGD, that's also the number of steps I do in my optimization. So what this asks is for a linear time, right? Because D is the dimension, and the minimum I can look for is linear time. So it's linear in the dimension, maybe M tilde larger, so when uh, this is for the test, this is for the training. Then I have the following. For every epsilon, so that will be a quality of my approximation, there exists a time, depending on epsilon, such that now if I take whatever time horizon larger than this and less than that, and with high probability, and for every class, right, this means remember C between 1 and K is for every one of the K classes, then if I look at this, this is the state so let's take time to read this, because that's the real theorem. If I take the state of my SGD, and I look at the C component, right, the third component, it lives in the top eigenspace, EK, remember? The top K, top K eigenspace of the Hessian at XL of the CC block, of the diagonal block. Okay, remember my Hessian is, we're in dimension Rd to the k, so it's made of k by k, k square block. Here you look at, the, simply you look at the diagonal block, you want to look at the third class, it lives, you look at the diagonal third block, you look at the top eigenspace, and then your SGD is there. 
So what does it mean that it lives in a space up to an error? I would explain. It just means that essentially the, uh, the projection on the space, the norm of the projection is that percentage of the full norm. So if this is 0, 0, 0, 001, it means that 99% of the norm of this vector is in that space. Okay? So what is the error? First, there's the epsilon that I chose, and then there's a one over lambda. Right? Lambda again being the strength of the noise, the width of the of the peaks. Okay? No dimension, no anything. Right? And this is true for any in the whole interval between T0 and Tf multiplied by 1 over delta. Remember, delta is like 1 over d, right? So delta minus 1 is like d. So when I multiply this by d, I get m, right? So that's essentially for a long period of time, I'm sure that the k score, the c co coordinate, if you want, of your, the c part of your SGD dynamics, lives mostly in the top eigenvectors of the diagonal block, right? There is no reason for that, really, okay. a priori. But of course, if your function is, as I said, essentially not a function of very many variables and a function, really seriously a function of a few variables, this should happen, okay? Okay, so that's the core theorem. Check the distance of L. The L refers to the, the algorithm. Yeah, that's the time. That's also the index of the sample because it's the same thing, remember. Yeah, yeah, and the C refers to the, the class, class, the D uh, components of the... Class. Yeah, so you have K, five classes. C is one, two, three, four, five. Right? So, and each of these is in RD. Okay? Remember, X, X lives in RD to the five. So XL3 lives in RD. Okay, and you say, and you have the same thing for XL, one, two, three, four, five. You look at these things, each of them lives in this top eigenspace. This tilde here means, remember that I'm doing here, the, I'm looking at the Hessian on the test thing, right? So I do my training with a certain amount of data, then I take another bit of data and I look at the, that's how I evaluate the train, the, the Hessian, and I have this relationship. So this thing did, did not even rule the algorithm, these data, the data that are hidden here, right? Of course, if I could test it, it's also true with the population loss, but the population loss, are not, I want to build something here which is testable, which is statistically significant. This you can try, right? Here, it's empirical. I give you the test, I give you the training data, you run the, the SGD, you look at what's happening after a certain amount of time, and this will happen. This is a way to... Okay, so... So here I said, remember here I said that uh, this lives here up to an error. So the, pro the statement means that, this is what I just told you. A vector lives in a subspace up to error eta. Means simply that the alignment, which is... Well, I missed two, a norm here. The norm of the orthogonal projection on B divided by the norm of E, okay, is greater than 1 minus eta, right? So if eta is 1%, you live in a subspace up to an error of 1%, meaning that your projection on it is 99% of your norm. So here in the theorem I, I said before, you could say, yeah, but I don't like this idea of having, of not using all my data. I don't like to, to here to use the trainings, the, the, the test thing. I would like rather to look at the, the, the training set, the one I'm using, so that I use all my data on that. You could do that, but we're not good enough to... We get the same result, but we, we lose a log D. Okay, that's... and it's probably not optimal. It's just that we are lazy. Okay, after 80 pages of that, enough. But if somebody wants to kill the log D, I'm sure it's killable. Um, so, I explain everything here with the Hessian. Right? Either the, the Hessian of the training, uh, the training Hessian or the, the test Hessian. But I could do the same, the same theorem exactly. You replace Hessian 
by the gram matrix, which I introduced before, which is built, which is not second order, just first order, built out of gradients, not Hessians, and you have the same result. Right? That is also interesting and surprising, as I predicted before. This is really behind this philosophy of the function only depends on k variables, really. So then its gradient or its Hessian are essentially function of this k thing. So it's perfectly natural that the spectrum of the Hessian or of the Gram matrix, the top of it, are in fact the same. Right? That's what we're seeing here. Of course, the rest of it is very different. And I'm, I'm arguing that nobody wants to look at the rest of it. The rest, is the, the rest of these spectra, whether it's the Hessian or the Gram matrix, all this mess here is just mess. Right? The information is here. Yes? I've, I've never manipulated. So the Gram matrix would be the matrix of VI, VJ, VI being the vector of the, the gradient vector. You take the gradient, yeah. okay? And so it's in, here it's a vector of dimension dk, because my thing is in dimension dk, right? This, of course, doesn't have a, a spectrum. It's just one vector. But now you have many of them, right? You have m of them or m tilde of them, whatever, depending on whether you take the Hessian, the training of the test thing. And when you have m of them, then you can look at this matrix multiplied by its transpose. Yeah, that's right? what I thought. So and th that is you're looking at the singular values of these things. Right? And this spectrum has exactly, for the top, is exactly the same behavior than for the Hessian. But I've never heard of that. I mean, is, it, is the one known thing, even if I would do basic continuous limit, or it's obvious that the matrix of the x transpose x is the gradient vector is related to the... No, that's what I'm saying. The, it's not obvious. No. It's, as I was saying, this is mess. If you, most of the theorem that people would, I mean, if you want to say something like you're saying, the two spectra are the same, it's not true. The mess is the mess. What statistics teaches you since the 17th century is do principal component analysis. The information is here. So the top, the only thing that was important here was what I call EK, that is the top K directions, the top K spectral directions. And these are the same. Why? Because these are essentially the space generated by the mu K. Okay, right. I think I got it. So you mean they, they both have bulk plus mini bulk plus outliers, but the bulk and mini bulk can be different for both. The, 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 I'm not even sure that in this case there's a mini bulk. We didn't try that. But, but at least the, 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 imp the thing which, let's put it differently, the information part, the thing where there is information, is the top. Yeah. The rest is mess. Okay? That's, uh, so uh, then the info they share the same informative part. The rest, who cares? And you certainly don't want to study that. But by the way, coming back to when I started this thing on random matrices, these are again two examples of the two large classes of matrices. Remember? Random matrices, that was Wigner and that was Wishart. So how did I think of this? Uh, how did we think of this? Wishart, right? That is, you had XX star and you had random uh, IID uh, symmetric. That's exactly what we have. Hessian is a, a, a real symmetric random matrix. And this one, the Gram matrix, is, a, is an XX star type matrix. Okay? But of course, in this case, so remember the you, initial BBP was done with an XX star situation, a Wishart situation. But in this very, in this, the initial BBP 20, 20 years ago, you also had outliers, but this bulk was very simple. It was the Wishart distribution. You had an explicit expression. Here, it's probably terrible. And the most important thing to remember is nobody wants to know anything about it. Right? You just want to say it's far away, it's mess, it's junk. I don't look at it. Okay, so that's, so that's important. Math, because numerically, it's probably much easier to follow the Gram matrix than the Hessian. Still, of course, computing the Gram matrix here will be very simple, because you need to compute the, the gradient anyway. But, but computing its spectrum is, of course, very difficult. Let me say something else again. This here, after this picture, we don't care about computing the spectrum of the Gram matrix. So if somebody is good enough at numerical linear algebra, which I'm not, it's the important thing here is along the trajectory to follow the top of the spectrum, right? Which is much simpler, right? The first, the top eigenvalue or top eigenvector is easy to find, that I know. And, and then you have variational principle for the, the next ones. 
And the important thing, of course, is to you don't you don't maybe you don't even know how to stop because, as I told you, you don't always have all the classes. So if you have a way to follow the top of the spectrum, you also need a, a way numerically to say it's far enough from the bulk. To say then then this is informative. Okay, so here's what the gram matrix is. You take the red, red star and then and you could define similarly the the gram matrix on the training or on the test set. And then the theorem would be the same. Okay. So if I were good enough with the computer, but now since it's not my computer, I can do that, I would show you pictures of how the eigenvalue behave and so on. But go to the paper, you'll see nice pictures. So this theorem that I just told you, result, this follows from a theorem that describes the SGD trajectory, its Hessian, the gram matrix, and their top eigenspaces that live up to a certain error in this span. So all these guys, are in fact, which, whether it's the state of the SGD, the top of the, 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 the spectrum of the uh, Hessian, or the top of the spectrum of the Gram matrix, I'm saying they are all kind of the same, but they are all the same because the three things are the same to a fourth thing, which is the important object, which is the span of the centers of classes. Right? You have these centers of mass. That's where it's natural. You're, you're, your uh, Gaussian, your distribution is like that. The only real information you have in it are these centers of classes plus the PAs, right? So up to an error which depends on this lambda, it lives in this thing, which of course you don't know. If you know a priori where, where this space is, then you just have to follow that. So in fact, here is the real theorem. So the following things live in this space, which is the space you want to discover, up to an error of epsilon plus 1 over lambda with high probability, going to 1 with the dimension. So the state of the SGD, a long training, so you look, as I said before, you take the SGD, you take the C class, each of them is the, there, for every C. If you take the, 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 the block of the Hessian, here I took the empirical Hessian, for any, any block, so this is a matrix, so I should say what it means that the matrix lives in a vector space, I'll do that later. And same thing for the blocks of the Gram matrix. So that's basically the important theorem. What, it, what this means is that, as I said before, I said there are three things that are essentially the same, the state of the SGD and the top of the spectra of the Gram or Hessian. But in fact, these three are the same because they are all the same to the fourth thing, which is the thing you want to estimate. So this tells you something. Um, now, now something else. This tells you that this projection on this space, if you want, on the top eigenspace, which is very close to the space spanned by the means, will be a summary statistics. You have interesting projection in this direction, in this space. But now, the training dynamics in this low rank space can be very complicated, can be not very, but can be quite complicated. Like what I described before. You have summary statistics, you project, they can do all sorts of things. So, and that depends on the finer structure of the P's and of the mu's. Right? So, for instance, I said, uh, uh, you know, Im imagine that your mu's are, I assume them to be linearly independent. But uh, uh, let's say I have two like this and the third like that very close, then an interesting thing can happen. If I had my P's that were, you know, 0 0.01, 0 0.01, and 0 0.98, then again, if my mixture is essentially made of cats and the dogs and cars are a very small number, it's a different story. So we cannot study all of them and it becomes heavy. So what we've done is that we have assumed that the mu's, the simplest case is to assume that the mu's are orthonormal, so I don't have something like this, and that the P's are all equal, right? Remember when we had the Gaussian mixture with two, the all equal induces, when you had only two, we could use the, the it's a single index model, and we could use the information exponent. Taking the P's to be, to be one half, made the information exponent go from one to two. 
right? So it made it a little more complicated, which is natural, right? If you have one half, one half, it's a little more complicated to, to estimate that in two thirds, one third. So in this case, here's what we find that's a longer story. So in this case, we're in this one simple case, this projection. Now, up to now, we're saying in whatever case, you have this projection on the top eigenspace, which is in fact the space of the means, which is autonomous, basically. And now I'm saying, in this particular case, because I just want to be able to state one nice theorem, here's what happens. The, the, well, that's, that should be a small. So you look at the, 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 let's say C equal three, you look at the third part. It has, so it lives in the space, let's say we have three, right? I look at, or let's say we have five, I look at number three, it should be close to mu three, right? Because it's in this number three here. So it should be around here. So what I, and, and uh, so what happens here, and if you don't know what mu one, mu two, mu three are, the only thing you can follow are the eigenvectors. What you find is that this positively correlates with the top eigenvector of the CC block for the Hessian or the Granian. Remember what we did for, for let's say, tensor PCA type things. At some point, we were looking at the posit possibility to have positive correlation when we would escape the equator. And at some point, we had this positive correlation with the North Pole or with the top eigenvector, which were very close. And that's the same thing here. So this guy, this uh, after L steps of SGD, it is positively correlated, which is hard, remember, we are in very high dimension. So again, being positively, typic, two typical vectors will be zero correlated, will be orthogonal, positively correlated with the top eigenvector of the CC block, either for this or for that. And more important, or as important, it's negatively correlated with the other eigenvectors. Okay. So this means you have, let's say we're in dimension, we have five classes. I have a space of dimension five, which is the space of the five means. But if I look at the chord, the block of size, uh, the, the third block of my SGD, it should correlate with the third class, right? That's what it says. It correlates positively with the, the third, with the top eigenvector of the third block, the three, three block, okay? But, interestingly, it negatively correlated with the others, right? So the others are... Why not zero? I mean, it's probably a stupid question from a non probabilist that I would have expected, but the, when you say correlation, you take it... Inner product. No, it's not, it's, uh, I shouldn't say correlation. Inner product, angle. I would have said zero because you see... That's, of course, what you think, but it's... No, this is, that's why this is interesting. Because zero would have been typical, right? When you take two, it would be typical. Here, there's a repulsion effect. This is really bizarre and hard. It means in the direction of where it should go, it's cool, it's positively correlated, which is, as you remember, an exponentially small thing to, uh, to achieve, which is hard. But for the other, it goes in the wrong direction, which is also very un unprobable. It's not zero, precisely. It's negative over one. And this is very improbable. Oh, so in your initial picture, the good one is the North Pole and all the other ones are the South Pole. Yeah, so, but here, of course, I have. So the, the third component aligns with the top eigenvector of the third component. What, what, what this tells you is the following. When you take the third, the three, three block, let's say of the Hessian, it has uh, many eigenvalues. You look at the top K, top five, if you have five classes, it's only the top eigenvector that is important for you. The other ones are, in fact, repulsing you, right? So that's uh, really interesting. And you see that, that's why I cannot show you, I'm sorry I can't show you pictures, but you see that very clearly, in fact. You, when, you, when you follow that dynamically, you see this correlation. So they all start together to climb, and then the first one goes up to one, essentially, and the other just decays very quickly. So that's, of course, it's in this particular situation. So that means, in fact, 
that this dynamical system in the projected space is, is simple. You don't have crazy stuff happening. Okay, so that's interesting. There's plenty of room here to study cases which are more complicated than that. Numerically, what you see if they're not equal, the PAs is... They are what? When PAs are not equal, let's say numerically, what would be the prediction? It's, uh, it's very different uh, or... Uh... No, it's probably... The, when the P, of course, as long as the PA are not going to zero or one or whatever, it should be simple. In fact, there is something simpler that should happen, in fact, here. I'm not sure that we have this repulsion. The repulsion may be less strong. That's uh, because, in fact, what happened that when, when this alignment, when P, the PA are equal, the alignment takes a little longer to happen. When they are different, it should happen more, uh, more rapidly. Uh, what would be more complicated, I'm sorry, it's not when the PA are equal, it's when the when the mu's are not orthonormal, right? When, again, if, imagine that you have two like that and the third like that, then of course it becomes difficult to distinguish those two. It would be the case, the same spirit as if you take tensor PCA with multi spikes, and you have two spikes that are you know very close. Then this is the same thing. Okay, so now, so okay, if you got what my story about the, um, this Gaussian classification. And again, that's the one that was... So you see, it's, the problem seems to be simple. You just have one hidden layer and then... And, uh, and still the structure... And, but you have these blocks in the Hessian and still the structure is interesting. Okay? The important thing here, if you remember, is that it happened... Okay, where is my theorem? Sorry for that. Ah, uh, here. Right. It happens after this time, which is not big, right? So, you know, in, in this regime. So this, this initial phase where, you know, the system finds the top eigenspace is, is pretty short right, in, this, in this problem. So, but in your assumption, you have m larger than alpha zero d, so yeah. it's still quite... Uh... No. This is small. This is as small as you can imagine. This is the fastest you can. This, when I said linear time, right? You cannot do that in less. But you know, in all, for instance, in tensor PCA, that was the, sim the single exponent, the ex information exponent one would give you that. And then if you had information exponent two, you would have a d log d, and if you and if you had information three, you would have a d to the power uh, three p minus two over two, right? So, no, no. This is the fact. You cannot imagine to go with less steps than the dimension. Or at least I can't imagine. Maybe somebody, somebody super smart would invent something, but I don't see it. Okay, so now we come to a harder problem, which, have, which we have already described, which is the XOR problem. Okay, But the XOR problem, I describe all this projection, blah, 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 very quickly. I told you it's fascinating, but not spectrally. So let's look at it now if, if something else happens. So we'll go back to the classical, classical XOR problem. So let me remind you the notation. We also have something of the same nature. We have uh, Gaussian mixtures as before, and the Ys are just labels as before, but here they are, we have only two labels. So they are Bernoulli, probability one half. And remember what, what happened when this Y is one. So in the first class, X is a mixture of Gaussian centered at mu and negative mu. And when y is zero, x is a mixture of Gaussian centered at nu and negative nu. So you could say this looks like a little bit like my, my GMM thing. I have four classes, okay? But in fact, no, because I'm not classifying into four classes, right? I have one class, I have only two classes, this class and that class, right? And that problem uh, has been invented to bug the computer scientists, right? And uh, and, uh, and it's the first one where you cannot have simply a linear classification sim uh, too, too simply. So we discussed this one. And the classification, I told you what uh, the network was to, to be used. So you use a two-layer network, again, with a cross-entropy loss. And uh, so remember here, sigma was the sigmoid, G was the ReLU activation. Remember that W were the weights in the first layer, 
you had two layers the weights here were w the weights here were v here you had k output and here you had plenty of them okay so g x plus is the ReLU activation function and the loss is the same very similar to what we had before in this context it's that when you use the cross entropy and again this thing is as before the l2 normally the l2 regularization with the fourth strength beta and of course now the L2 contains both the V and the W. Okay, so W is a K by N matrix. No, I'm sorry, I, I keep doing the, the same mistake. Sorry, v is, W is here, this is N, and V is here. So V is a, a K by N matrix. Because for each point here you have n numbers, and v is a k vector. Okay. So that's our loss. We've seen that last time. So we've seen that there exists, I told you, that there exists natural summary statistics and that their effective dynamics have a rich phenomenology it's interesting but uh, the question is here can this be seen just looking at it from a dynamical spectral transition point of view so i have again the loss function that i just defined here again i could start this whole story if you just trust me i said here's an interesting function let's study its minimization Right, that's what we're doing here. And then we do online SGD. We, as before, we do a Gaussian initialization. I'm missing a parenthesis here. Step size of the same nature as before. So we are exactly in the same situation. Except as having a, a KGMM here, I have this strange, let's say a 4GMM, I have this strange XOR situation. Of course, you know, if you think of it, it's a strange object, the XOR thing, because it's as if I was, had to classify. Um, uh, the only thing I could say was this is in the class of dog and peanut and this is, uh, or cat and car. Right? Strange thing. It's a bizarre object, of course, but that's what it is. So the theorem is very similar. There is a constant alpha zero such that when M the size of the sample is larger than alpha zero d, or the length of the of the uh, SGD algorithm. And if the, str if the the lambda is large enough, lambda remember was the variance. I mean, one over lambda was the variance. Then the following hold, same thing for every epsilon. There is a time such that for any finite time above that, for any uh, or oh, there is no there is no c here. Yeah, except, okay, let's, let's forget that. With probability close to one, then there's, forget this C, there is no C. The C, this is a remnant of the other case. So here is what it is. The parameter you're following is this W and V. What I call X now is W and V, right? That's the parameter. Before, the, my X was in RD to the K. Now my X, the, the, the parameter, is a W V thing, so it's a, a, a vector, a matrix that says n by k and a, and a k vector, right? W is the first layer, V is the second layer. So what I'm saying here is that when I take for an i, when I look at W i of X L, it li lives in the top. Remember what that means. So I look at the Hessian here. That's the the test Hessian. Okay, and in the block WI, WI, like before I had the block CC, whatever. And I look at the top two eigenvectors. Then this lives in this thing up to a small error and this whole interval, right? So again, this tells you that the, the parameter that you've built, the W, so this one, lives in this top two eigenspace. And now if I look at the estimate for V, for the second layer, it lives in the top four thing 
up to the same error, blah, blah, blah. So here you have a very uh, clear manifestation of the fact that the, 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 BB, the spectral transition happens. Right? And it's, uh, so of course, this is more painful. I'm confused with the two and four, actually. Yeah, that's, that's the important part. So here, of course, uh, by the way, I should have said, here K is four. <laughs> ah, so in the second layer you capture the whole classification. Yes. Ah, okay, K is four. And, and also your model XO, which seems to be super classical, but I was trying to, to get intuition. It's like you take a Gaussian mixture and you add this barely noise on. No, 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 no. It's. No, the important thing, it has been built to be non linearly separable. So a Gaussian mixture, for instance, would be, you, we could imagine a Gaussian mixture with four things. They would not be, if you put them in the same plane, we would violate my assumption that they would be linearly independent. Oh, you, have, you take them linearly independent? No, 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 no. In the, in the Gaussian mixture model, I assume them to be linearly independent. Here, they are, the, the four centers are mu, negative mu, and nu, negative nu. So they are linearly dependent. They are the four in the same plane. Okay? But more importantly, it's not only that, more importantly, is that you have, it's a mix, you are either, either here or there, or here or there, right? So that's, that's why it makes this complicated. You, can, you don't have a linear separation. You have, you're not doing a mixture of four, you have four bumps if you want, four Gaussian bumps, but it's now, your distribution is this or that, okay? And that's, that's what your Y is, okay? You don't have four classes, you have two classes. Okay, okay that's what, that it's, of course it's built in a pervert way. It's built in a way to make it uh, non-linearly separable and complicated, right? And this is, as I said, something that uh, this kind of defied the logic that came from perception and which needed, it was solved when people understood that they needed two layers. And as I said, I thought this has happened, had happened at the beginning of the 80s. I understand it happened in the 70s. So the, the two layers, the first one understands the four classes, and then the second one regroups them in two parts, or? We don't know. What, 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 so th this is the first layer, right? Yes. This is the second. You need these two layers. I don't know. Of course, what's, it's, it's the, out, the total output which gives you the class. You need these two yes, things. Yes, yes. But but I, like the first one would, would identify the four peaks. I'm not sure. I'm not sure. My, I don't know. That I don't know. I've not, I, I really don't know what they do. So the, the logic here that you really need the two. And the, important, the fun part here is that I, I have this spectral thing, but it's, you need to go deeper here than here. Right? That's a... So, so you see, it was really invented to fail the one layer of problem. Yes. So what, the one layer would just always capture, uh, like you said. You, you, you could, if you had this four, it would capture these two together or these two together, and the, you, you, you could not do this thing. And that's what you get in the second. Yeah. Okay, so again, you could have the same with the gram matrix. Here I explained with the Hessian, you could do the same thing with the gram matrix. And you could do that with the training Hessian rather, or gram matrix instead of the test one, or not DD, of course, just log D. <laughs> this would just change uh, the constant. Okay, so the same picture holds here. And that's my last slide. Okay, so um, the... So now I can, uh, you know, I, I wanted to give results, and uh, if you want, I can spend a little time uh, explaining maybe more importantly what the what should be done, right? and the, the other results. So first, the, uh, this is, okay, this one is two layers. Um, you know, one should look, you could do, and that's, so don't try to do that because that's what we're finishing now. Uh, so you, there's no point in racing, there's enough room in this thing. So you could do classification of, of a, KGMM with more than one layer, more than one hidden layer, right? And indeed, that's what people do because it's supposed to be more 
efficient. So, but then of course the, the structure of the random matrix and so on is more complicated, and you also have the, so we, we this is being done now, and you see again I shouldn't say that because the theorems are not we didn't put the last stamp on them, but they will be true. Uh, the again you have the structure about the the the, the different the different things brought by the different layers. Okay, so depending on how you would organize the information on the classes, you would see different things on the different layers. And that's what people in practice know. Right? So, so all that can be done. The, the, again, the random matrix problem is always complicated. Because as you've seen, let's come back to the, the case where we had one, only one layer. You've seen that it was something like a BBP transition, but it was a BBP transition from something complicated. Right? We had one big object where we couldn't say much, and then a finite rank perturbation. Right? So, in, so it starts always with calculus and then with random matrix theory. Which is uh, so. It would be nice to have some kind of abstract nonsense thing, right? Uh, to again come back to Holmes, uh, uh, to Bourbaki, right? To say abstractly, here is a model and with that many layers, and then this BBP transition would happen, even if it's in a bad regime. I mean, an extreme regime or whatever. But I believe this would be true. Uh, will we be uh, too lazy to do it? I don't know, but. I'm sure that there is a, 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 an abstract version of that for essentially any system. The real problem will be, so we chose all these things because we could see that the initial phase would correspond to the information exponent when the index is 1, that the initial phase would be short. And this is the important thing we prove here, right? The important thing is what we prove here. What you call the initial phase is the dimension of the t zero. No, this t zero, the time after which this thing happens, right? So we start. Remember, we start completely at random. We start Gaussian, okay? And nevertheless, we prove that in those models, after a short time, then this spectral things happen, right? So it could very well be that. The, so remember tensor PCA. Right, then this initial phase was not short. If you now with this in mind, let's come back to tensor PCA. Right. So we had this. So we remember. So we had this the sphere. We remember that the summary statistics was the latitude, the projection in one axis, and all this type of thing. So we would have a dynamical BBP transition. Right. The top, the, the vector you find will align with the top eigenvector of the Hessian. Right. Once you have escape the equator. Okay. But in order for this to happen, remember we needed a time which was like the dimension d here, d to the power k minus 2 over 2, or p minus 2 over 2. So a long time, which is here we're saying it happens after a linear time. Right? So it could very well be that in general, for instance tensor PCA, if you adapt this to tensor PCA, the initial phase will be longer. So when is it, that? Uh, how can we understand this this initial phase, because the real problem practically is that you're running this thing, if you had, if this tells you a signal saying, beep, your system is working, because I can compute the spectrum of the Hessian, I look at my thing, it's in there, things are cool, but, but, you know, it could never work, and then you don't know, and then you have to have more and more data to see it work. So, and, and again, in, in the tensor PCA, this, it would take time. So that's the real question. How much time does it take for, to get out of what the, the, the people in the field call? There are, in fact, in this field, they, they distinguish five different phases. Right? So, but globally here, let's distinguish two. The search phase, where the thing doesn't work, and the, the, um, this uh, descent phase, where things begin to seriously work. Okay? So here I'm saying when the descent phase works, you know how it works. It works in the spectral direction. Right? The, the dimension in which things happen is this top spectral thing. But how do we know that we're getting out of the initial phase? How do we speed the initial phase? The most important thing first is this detection. It's how do we know we are getting out of the, the, the initial phase? Because when you do an optimization and you see your thing just kind of, will something else happen or not? You don't know. And you cannot simply invest in buying a million more data. Right? So that's, there is the kind of uh, first phase to understand, first to detect, and second, 
how do you push out of it? So the real question would be, because all these are analysis of things that kind of work, the real question would be, um, if you have a problem where the initial phase is, the search phase is long, this BBP transition takes a long time to happen, right? Because at first I say there, there must be a theorem saying that in long enough time the, the spectral BBP thing will always happen, right? essentially. Because, of course, it cannot happen for any function. Right? If you take, for instance, a pure spin glass model, there is no BBP to happen. You don't, have, you don't have good directions. So if you have a structure of your function which is like that, where you have a finite rank signal, then in the end you should have something like this. But the question is, if in your architecture the initial phase is slow, so first, how can you detect that you're still there? But second, how can you change the architecture to make it fast? Now that's the real problem. That's not a mathematics problem initially, it's an engineering problem. But of course it becomes a math problem. So now the question I, I, I would have to say, so for, for the moment we just have examples. But it would have, we have this functor, if you want, that goes from the architecture to the time for this uh, BBP phase, spectral phase to happen. And the next question is how to make it short. How to change the architecture to make it short. Right? That's completely out of what I can do. Okay, so I think it's a good point to conclude. Again, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Very inspiring for, for lecture. Uh, are there any uh, questions? Yes? Yeah, uh, about this initial phase that you described, like, like we, we, we know that like it uh, depends a lot on the kind of initialization you use, and especially the scale. Yes. No, but here, here I'm using only completely non-informative. I know nothing. It's never. Whole but even, even if you know nothing, the scale uh, has. A, for example, it can be in the NTK regime if you use large initialization, or in a completely different regime if you have initialization that is very close to zero. Yeah. So that's my question. You're right. So here. On purpose, remember, I've taken the uh, a Gaussian with variance 1 over d. That means it's the closest you can have a uniform thing. So the flattest possible, where I didn't want to put any info. But of course you could imagine, but then, then something else would happen. If I, if I change the scale, right? So if I make the scale even bigger, then the classification will be worse. So if I make the scale sh shorter, right? Which, because remember, the scale is in my, is lambda. Right here, the scale is lambda. Right, because remember the, the, the variance was, uh, so I start, um, it depends which scale we're talking about. The initial scale is not lambda, the initial scale I had fixed, right? Yeah, the, the, the lambda is the scale of the, of, the, of the, if I have a Gaussian mixture for instance, it's the scale of the, the size of the peaks. Uh, no, I don't know, I'm talking about the, the scale. scale of your parameters at initialization. Yes, so that's, the, here, that's what I call D. So here I, I fixed one and I moved the other one. But of course you could move both. But of course if you start with an initial thing which is too peaked, right? So imagine that you have this classification here and you have three peaks to find and you find, and this one is close to zero and you start with a Gaussian. If your Gaussian is large enough then you will capture some of these. But if your Gaussian is here and very peaked, there's a large chance that you find this one much more than these ones. And so it could, it could be, if you do that, it could, I'm, I'm concerned, I mean, it's very interesting, but it could be that when you change this initial parameter, it could be that the, so that you change the equator to come back to my tensor PCA. That's what it is. The, what you're talking about is the width of the equator. So if you choose, if you change that, it could be that your system works very fast, but very badly. So this is what we have seen. I told you at some point here in this classification of KGMM, you see that. It's part, I said that at some point, something important, which people want to not read, in, in particular when they really work in this thing, which is here. Oops. Sorry for that, this is the bad thing. Ah, that was before I stated the theorem.
Where did it go? I'm sorry, I'm really sorry for that. Yes, here. So, it's possible, so that's the third point, right? So in, in this classification of k-means, for instance, it could be that things look cool, because I, I have, you know, uh, so first there is the C of k, right? The C of k is not necessarily, in all cases, it's not necessarily k, right? I'm saying, you know, the projection on this top k is essentially everything. But in fact, it could be that your projection instead of dimension five is dimension three, right? So in this example, for instance, you find only one peak instead of three, right? And so that's the C of k. And then, and then you still have a very nice alignment and so on. And the classification, when, if, when you find a suboptimal thing, then the, uh, you know, the, the spectral alignment happens, right? So it's a, uh, so, all that, you know, all that is to be taken in, in, into account. So, for instance, here is a very simple, I mean, example which is coming, which is not yet posted. So that's a joint work with Cédric Gerbelot and uh, Vanessa Piccolo, where you look at the dynamics of the SGD for multi-spike tensor PCA. So that's an academic problem, but where you can really understand everything. And you see all this. It could be that you have, you know, five vectors to find, five spikes to find, and you find only two, or that, you know, you find, you find a plane made of two, but you don't find the two, right? All sorts of things depending on, so you have to be a little careful. If you wait long enough, then the BVP transition is fully realized. You don't have C of K, you really have K, they are well, everything works. But in between, right, so it's not simply, you don't simply have an initial phase where nothing works, you have zero signal. You begin to see a few things, but they are not yet there. So you need a signature to see whether, you know, you... And, and of course, for the moment, I cannot tell you that, right? It's, uh, uh, here I said, I know that there are K classes, so I look at the K top eigen space, and then I see something. But if in fact there are, there are K plus three classes, though I'm project predicting could be wrong. But this, this swim you will see uh, popping out yes. dynamically later on. Later on, yes, but of course if you have enough data. Mm -hmm. If I think that there are five classes, I wait, I have my five classes, I'm happy, I go home. Mm -hmm. The algorithm continues to run and then find th five, three more if I have more data. But m most people would do just shut the system because it costs an enormous amount of money to let it run. So yeah, there's... Uh, but you know, this, this is good news. This is called science, right? Mm. We've understood everything and then boom, something else comes. That's a... the, the, so the, the minimal doesn't seem to be relevant for your analysis or so, you, you don't think it... Yes, it is. It is very... Here it is not because I treated... The only example I really gave was the case where they were orthonormal. Okay. So then this minimal becomes irrelevant. But this, relevant, this minibulk again gives you the angles between the classes. But so, so, so your, your Asian, you will see also uh, more, uh, I mean, uh, after to determine where you are, more structure by using the minibulk or? You, in order to do that, you would need, if you want to really see the, okay, the, 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 your, esti your estimator in this classification of, gives you the different vectors, right? The, the different parameters which are in RD to the K. Mm -hmm. Each RD is supposed to become one of the mu's, the center of the mass. Mm -hmm. So the, the minibulk would be the, the angles between them, right? They are not necessarily orthogonal, right? So, and as I said, the, 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 the projection of these things on the space of the mu K becomes autonomous. But if, if the mu K's are not orthonormal, then it will be much more complicated, precisely because this, these angles will play a role. Mm -hmm. Here, when, when the mu are orthogonal, orthonormal, then these angles are supposed to be diagonal, where right? it's just the identity. So it's just one number and it's nothing. But, but in general, yeah, it, they, they could be there. It could be fun. <laughs> Uh, by the way, I'm sorry, there's also something else, sorry, I forgot, I should have told you, but it, it was in a formula, but it's easy to miss. The minibulk was, had a 1 over lambda square in front of it. So not only is it, 
So in the orthonormal case, it has no real interest in culture uh, structure. But when lambda is large, this just this this thing becomes. That's why I put this cut between this and that because this is one over lambda. This is one, and this is one over lambda square. And and uh, is there a way to so the, your main theorem? which of course is, I imagine, using a lot of random matrix uh, tools and results. Is there a, a, any continuous limit where your theorem can be interpreted as a separation between discrete and continuous spectrum of an object? Yes, yes, definitely. But the problem for this is, this is a terrible notion. That is, it's, it's there, but it's a pain. You could, let's forget all this story. And I'm, I rephrase your question. Sorry for those if you're not interested, but it, you, you have random matrices, which are n by n things, let's say IID, Gaussian, you know, whatever, and you're asking, and so I have a spectrum, and the, the, the basic theorem says the spectrum is a semicircle, and I'm asking, is there a spectral interpretation of that for the limiting object? That's what you're saying. Is there a limiting object with that? And the answer is yes, but for that you have to go to what is called free probability which means non-commutative uh, uh, factors, type two factors, right? That's what Voiculescu did. So you have this story, it exists, you haven't. So when you do non-commutative- non It's not an operator in the usual sense of that. It is, it is a complicated story, yeah. That is, okay. as a probabilist, you, you just say, I, I'm interested in the, lim in the finite n thing, and, the, and then I have all the limiting theorem, I'm happy. If you want to go one step further, and a lot of us did, you follow what Voiculescu did in the 90s, and then you have this notion of free probability theory, where you have, as I explained, you have a notion of convolution, free convolution, additive and multiplicative, and the additive multipli correspond to Wigner, the multiplicative correspond to Wishart, everybody's happy. But then, uh, so you have this, but if you really want to do the functional analysis, live in this thing, it's complicated. So. Here, when you do this type of thing, it might, for instance, I don't know, because it might be that there is a, 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 a type 2, 1 factor version of, uh, of the BVP transition, right? That is, you have this limiting thing up there, and then you add a finite rank thing. It's possible. And it might be that we can do all that. But, and, and indeed, of course, the evolution, the natural dynamics, you know, when you have the, for instance, the other way to look at random matrices are Dyson round in motion. As I explained, this is the main tool to prove hard theorems. So you take a, a, a random matrix and you take, let's say, symmetric. Each entry, you make it move like a Brownian motion. Gives you an evolution of a random matrix. Here I have something like this. I have an evolution of a random matrix, which is my Hessian, right? There is a notion of uh, Brown, free Brownian motion, and there is a notion of you know, a PDE, if you want, in this high infinite dimensional space up there. And so maybe there's a way, but... Uh, Okay, good question. <laughs> no, no, you're right. It, it, it's used to think in terms of this value. It's it's true that that it it, it might be possible. That, uh, that's true. Yes. Can your model work in semi 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 supervised learning, like you have some label labeled? Data and Maybe, I don't know. We could, you know, yes, it's possible. I don't know. I really don't know. The, um, you know, you, one could also ask, what about the non-supervised thing at all, right? You just have a mixture of Gaussian. You, you're just dumb. Uh, nobody tells you the cat is a cat, but you still learn. Uh, we haven't tried, but yeah, this, this could be possible. Well, thank you very much. So